a wide range of topics in astrophysics, his studies on the possible relationships between cosmic rays intensities and the Earth's climate, and the Milky Way's spiral arms and ice age epochs on Earth have been widely echoed in the scientific literature as well as in the general press. There's also more on, uh, on Nir's biography in your, in your booklet there. And with that being said, Nir Shaviv. It's a great pleasure being here. Um, and uh, it's even uh, an honor to be the first uh, speaker to open the uh, uh, panel uh, session. Uh, what's, uh, can you see? The, yes, you can. Uh, what I want to do is uh, discuss uh, one uh, particular topic. Uh, oh, here, can you hear me? Uh, what I want to do is to discuss one particular topic, and that's the role that the sun uh, has in uh, climate change. I hope that uh, by the end of this uh, 15 minutes, you will be convinced that uh, without understanding the role that the sun has uh, in climate change, you cannot understand what has, been, what has been happening over the 20th century. And uh, you'll also understand why alarmists are doing their best to uh, uh, play down, to uh, disregard, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, the role that the sun has on climate. Okay, um, I'll discuss a, uh, I'll discuss, I'll discuss, sorry, a, I'll discuss a few uh, points. Uh, first, I'll uh, begin by uh, saying things, uh, I'm fine, okay. I'll uh, say a few things about climate sensitivity and uh, radiative forcing. Um, and you need to understand uh, both of them if you want to understand what has been going on in the 20th century. Uh, in particular, uh, if, uh, I'll show you that uh, if, oh, sorry, I shouldn't be talking with my hands. If you want to understand, <laughs> since it's only 15 minutes, I won't say any jokes uh, about uh, hands. Uh, if you uh, want to understand the 20th century, um, you need to know exactly how much the relative forcing uh, was and what the uh, climate sensitivity is. And if you introduce more radiative forcing in the, in the, uh, in the, in, in, with the sun, it means that uh, you're going to under, uh, change your perception of what the radiative forcing should be. Um, I'll talk about uh, the sun, uh, evidence that uh, it has a large effect on the climate. And I'll also show you that uh, you can quantify it. And uh, let me begin. OK, radiative forcing. Um, and climate sensitivity. Uh, if you change the energy budget of the uh, Earth, just a second. I cannot see the slide. Now you can see the slides, and I'll know what I want to say. Um, if you uh, change the energy budget of Earth by a given amount, you will uh, cause it to heat or to cool. For example, if you double the amount of CO2, calculations show you that you change the energy budget by something like 3.8 watts per square meter. Now, you can plug it into global circulation models, whether you believe them or not, and then see how much the temperature will change. The change in the temperature is the response of the system. And if you look at the ratio between the change in the temperature and the change in the relative forcing, you get the uh, climate sensitivity here, this thing. Now, if you believe the IPCC, then this number uh, translated to uh, times the relative forcing of the CO2 is a temperature increase of one and a half to four and a half degree increase if you double the amount of CO2. Uh, if you open the last IPCC report, you'll find that uh, they increased it to uh, two degrees without any real reason. Why? I don't know, but uh, this is what they have done, probably because they want to frighten us. Okay, now. Why is this uh, ratio between uh, temperature change and uh, radiative forcing uh, the most important number in uh, understanding climate change? Um, the reason is that if you want to understand what has been going on in the 20th century, to know how much of the temperature is because of a change in the, um, uh, a, or if you want to explain it, then if you want to explain, if you want to explain the change in the uh, a temperature, you, a, needs to multiply the, um, a, the change in the energy budget with the sensitivity. Of course, this is a very simplistic uh, thing because 
Uh, first of all, it takes time for the system to react, so we have to take something on finite time scales. Uh, there are additional things which affect uh, the temperature, such as the uh, uh, internal oscillations like the PDO, but roughly speaking, the change over the 20th century is going to be the forcing that, uh, for example, we humans have been imposing on the climate times a, a sensitivity. Now, if you want to explain the given change in the energy budget, sorry, the given change in temperature with a given en change in the energy budget, you need a high climate sensitivity in order to explain that, okay? However, if there is any additional radiative forcing which has been responsible to, uh, uh, or has been playing a role over the 20th century, it means that the total radiative forcing over the 20th century was larger. And therefore, in order to explain the given change in a temperature over the 20th century, you need to multiply this larger number by a smaller climate sensitivity. Now, if the climate sensitivity is smaller, it means that the temperature increase over the 21st century is going to be smaller as well. Okay, so for this reason, it's very important to know whether there is any additional uh, factor which has been responsible for changing the energy budget over the 20th century, and there is, and that is the sun. Okay, so the sun is a variable star. It changes uh, its activity on different timescales, ranging from uh, days to, or even hours, to millennia or longer. Uh, the largest uh, variation is the 11-year solar cycle, over which the um, a polarity of the um, magnetic field uh, switches, but uh, on shorter and longer timescales, there are additional uh, variations. Uh, for example, uh, the 11 year solar cycle has a long term uh, secular modulation. Sometimes it's stronger and sometimes it's weaker. Uh, these changes in activity translate to small changes in the uh, solar irradiance, but also to relatively large variations in things like the uh, amount of UV, the strength of the solar wind, the strength of the magnetic fields, and things like that. It turns out that all those things affect the climate, and in 15 minutes it's totally impossible to show you the large range of uh, evidence that uh, proves that the sun has a large effect on climate. This is just one example. What you see here at the top is a reconstruction of the uh, solar activity uh, using carbon-14 from uh, tree rings. Uh, at the bottom, you see a reconstruction of the climate, uh, primarily of the Indian Ocean. That comes from oxygen-18 to oxygen-16 isotope ratios in stalagmites in a cave in Oman. And uh, clearly, you see that there's a very nice correlation demonstrating that the sun is affecting the climate in this case of the Indian Ocean, but you have other such evidence uh, demonstrating that sun affects the climate uh, in uh, the northern Atlantic, in China, in Antarctica, um, in a lot of places. Namely, it's a global effect. Okay, uh, where does this link uh, come from? Well, it turns out it doesn't matter where this link comes from because there is this evidence that the sun affects the climate. But as a scientist, I'm interested and curious to know where this link comes from. And the link comes from uh, this following mechanism. It was realized already in 1959 that the uh, atmospheric ionization changes by a, a change in solar activity. Uh, basically what happens is the following. When the sun changes its uh, activity, uh, it changes the strength of the solar wind. Uh, the solar wind blocks the flux of high energy particles, which are called cosmic rays, from coming from the uh, outside the solar system. Actually, they are coming from all around uh, the galaxy from the death of massive stars in supernovae. Now, when the solar wind is stronger, it blocks uh, this, uh, some of this radiation uh, coming to Earth. Actually, it uh, degrades its energy. Uh, and therefore, when the solar wind is stronger, less of these particles reach the uh, atmosphere, and we get less atmospheric ionization. It turns out that most of the atmospheric ionization outside is governed by the flux of these high energy particles called cosmic rays. Here it might be from radon gas from, uh, emanating from the concrete. Well, this is not concrete, but from the concrete. But uh, outside, it's totally governed by the flux of uh, cosmic rays. Now, it was suggested in the 70s and then uh, demonstrated already in the 90s that uh, the amount of ionization in the atmosphere changes the uh, formation rate of what's called the uh, cloud condensation nuclei, which are the small particles upon which you condense water vapor when you form clouds. So the link is the following. When the sun is more active, you have a stronger solar wind, less atmospheric ionization, less cloud condensation nuclei, clouds which are less white because they have less particles, and therefore an increase in the temperature. Okay, um, you can see this effect operating here. Uh, you see 
uh, in blue, the change in the cloud cover, and you see in red the change in the cosmic ray flux. You see here a lab experiment, this one carried out at CERN, demonstrating that when you increase the flux, uh, sorry, the uh, number of ions formed in a, a cloud chamber mimicking conditions you find over the oceans, you increase the formation of condensation nuclei. Uh, on very short time scales, you can see it operating in the atmosphere. You have things which are called Forbush decreases, when a, for a few days you get a decrease in the uh, cosmic rays reaching the Earth. You see in four independent data sets, uh, the left one is the uh, aerosols and three other ones the, uh, from three different cloud data sets. You see that as there is a reduction in the, uh, um, uh, in the uh, number of uh, ions because of reduced uh, uh, cosmic ray flux, you change, you reduce the number of condensation nuclei and you change different properties of cloud cover. Okay, uh, you also see that on geological time scales, you can reconstruct the cosmic ray flux using uh, meteorites and see that uh, the flux has been uh, varying with a periodicity of 145 million years, and that's because of our passages through the spiral arms of the Milky Way, and this synchronizes with changes in the temperature on Earth, which in this case you can uh, see with, um, um, with a reconstruction based on uh, fossils. Now, you can quantify this link. Um, what happens is the following. When the sun is more active and you change the energy budget because of the uh, cloud uh, amplification, you change the amount of heat which goes into the oceans. And as uh, Joe said in the previous uh, uh, presentation, the oceans have a very large heat capacity. So it tells you that when the sun uh, is more active, you expect all this extra heat to be absorbed into the oceans. And on short time scales, the oceans, because of their large heat capacities, don't have time to react. So the store most of this energy. Now what happened is that because they absorb all this heat, they expand thermally. So you should expect to see variations in the sea level uh, synchronous with the uh, solar activity. And this is exactly what you see here in this graph. You see here 80 years worth of tide gauge records showing you how the uh, oceans expand and decrease every solar cycle. Um, this can be used uh, as a huge calorimeter to measure the energy budget associated with changes in the solar activity. And lo and behold, it is something like six to seven times larger than what you would expect from changes in the solar irradiance. And it means that uh, the role that the sun uh, has been playing is much larger. Interestingly, it fits the change in the energy budget that you would expect from the change in, co in the cloud cover that you see synchronous with the uh, cosmic rays. This graph by itself tells you that the uh, sun is important and the IPCC cannot ignore the sun anymore. They'll tell you, oh, we're taking the sun into account, but what they really mean is that they're ta ta taking the small change changes in the irradiance into account. However, the sun has a large amplified effect, and you can see it here. You can uh, model the 20th century uh, using a, um, a, a diffusion model with several bo bo uh, boxes, and what you can ask uh, what you can do, you can leave everything as a free parameter, uh, say you're unbiased, leave things like the, um, like the uh, climate sensitivity, the coupling between the lands and the ocean, the diffusion uh, into the oceans, you can allow effects of uh, internal oscillations, um, and ask the question, for what range of climate parameters do you explain the 20th century? And the answer is, uh, uh, you can do that, and when you do that, you find a very good agreement. In fact, if you allow the sun to have a large effect on the climate, the agreement between the predicted or the model temperature and the observed temperature gives you a residual which is twice smaller than the residual you get with global circulation models. Why? Because they don't take the real effect of the sun into account. Okay, uh, you can get then uh, things like what is the uh, expected uh, contribution of the sun over the 20th century, and you find that uh, it is roughly what you would expect from the ocean as a calorimeter. Uh, you can, when you do the fit, you can ask the question, what is Earth's climate sensitivity? And it is, uh, in fact, something a little bit less than what the black body sensitivity is. Uh, for comparison, this is what the IPCC tells us it should be. Um, and so let me just uh, wrap up. There is an additional radiative forcing operating, and that is that of the sun. It means that the total forcing is a much larger. It means that the, in order to explain the 20th century, the climate sensitivity is smaller. It means that uh, with a lower climate sensitivity, the temperature increase over the 21st century is going to be smaller as well. 
you can make a prediction for what the uh, temperature is going to increase if you use the same model. For comparison, these are the IPCC model, and with this, I'll end.